Swinburne University of Technology. Now, well, welcome Ellie. Um, Ellie is the education advocate from Cisco, who's going to be presenting today. And we've also got an entourage of students from the Design Factory, who yeah. um, Ellie has been working with on yeah. the project. I'll bring my own entourage when I yes. present. So we're talking about the classroom of the future and collaboration. So I don't know whether we're going to talk, be talking about holograms or anything like that. Well, we might. We'll we have might. to wait and see. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm going to hand it over to um, to Ellie. Who's going yep. to well, thanks everyone for coming and, and taking time out of your day today. I really appreciate that. Um, I wanted to make today's session quite interactive. So rather than just sort of present and then you ask questions at the end, I'll ask a few questions back to yourselves that you might want to answer. So please feel free to participate throughout today's session. Uh, just to give a little bit of more brief background, I work in the um, higher education space. So I have a national role, so I'm often traveling to interstate working with a number of different universities and so some of the things that I'll be talking about today will be um, through some of the work that I'm doing with other universities and some of the things that they're doing so I wanted to sort of share the ideas of, of also what your peers are doing out in the industry. I also um, get involved in study tours, we've got one coming up next week where we'll go to London and we'll look at um, universities overseas and look at some of the things that they're doing and um, we often have um, academics and people from, from faculties coming on those as well to, to learn and share ideas. Thank you. So the agenda today is one minute of fun. I thought, you know, whenever you're learning, you've got to have something that's a little bit of fun. So I'm going to open it up with some fun. We'll be discussing um, connected learning. What does that mean? The changing landscape of education. How does a university stay re relevant in a competitive world? Um, and, and buildings because it's not just about technology, it's also about how you create and what you do in space that is just as vital for students. Um, then and now, so from pocket to campus, in the past it was all about the campus, it's not about that anymore, so we'll be looking at that. Um, Spark and the design factory, so I'm currently doing a, a 12 month project working with um, Swinburne's design students, so we'll talk a little bit about that and some of the, the tools that we're using to interact and collaborate with. So, Richard Wiseman, have any of you heard of Richard Wiseman? He's a famous psychologist and he does these um, one minute sort of fun pop quizzes. It's just um, information that is just interesting. So why have I got a cute puppy, a smiling baby, a happy family and an older couple up here? So basically Richard Wiseman did an experiment where he had 200 wallets and in those he put one of those pictures in different wallets. So there was a combination of, of pictures in the wallets and he then distributed the wallets around a major city. And what, why did he do that? He wanted to find out which picture would more likely bring the wallets back to him. So people would find the wallets in places, he put them in places they could easily be found, and then they'd open it up and they'd, the first thing that they would see in that wallet would be a picture. And which one did people feel more attracted to give the wallets back on? So I'm gonna open it up to ask you, which picture do you think is more appealing that led the wallets to come back to, to Richard Wiseman and on top of that before you answer that I do recommend having a look at some of his one minute sessions because I think they're quite fun to open up a, a class with just some irrelevant information that gets the right side of the brain working and gets more creative thought process. So over to, to you. Smiley baby. Any other thoughts? A couple? Yep. So the smiling baby, 88% of the wallets came back with the smiling baby. So the moral of the story, if you don't learn anything today, remember to get a picture of a beautiful smiling baby, pop it in your wallet in case it gets lost. I could have just saved you a lot of money and a lot of pain with organising your card. So if you learn nothing else, remember that. For any baby. Just as long as it's cute, cute and smiling. Any baby, it doesn't need to be your baby, just Someone's a cute baby. smiling baby. baby. Yeah. Baby. So connected learning, you know, this, um, the, the, this subject is something that's sort of dear to me because I always think, you know, how, how do we connect students up to teachers? And I think this, um, this proverb, which is a Eastern proverb, is, is that the teacher and the taught together create the teaching. Now, what does that mean? In the past, when universities were created, they were often created in an environment where that didn't happen. So, you know, it was more of, I am the teacher, I will teach you, and then you all participate 
when I need you to, which might be through essay format or it might be through exam format, but it wasn't this collaboration together. And when you look at industry, back in the days when the university sector started, that really, how, really was how industry was. So for example, I would be a person employed, I'd sit in a corner, someone would come up to me and go, here's all your paperwork for the week, maybe I needed to type that out, and I'll come back to you in a week's time and I'll, I'll pick it up. So there was no real collaboration, there was no real interaction. But those foundations which universities were built on have changed considerably, as I'm sure all of you are aware in, in this room. So today's learning environment to match industry is more around collaboration. So it is around the teacher and the taught together create the teaching. Because when you get to the workplace, um, a student will see a completely different environment. It's all around team-based working, or as industry now calls it, um, activity-based working. So it's about performing tasks together in a group. And there's many tools that we use to, to do that in the technology world. And even in our personal lives, you know, often in the past, you know, I would have, um, for example, written a letter to you, but these days, you know, we'll, we'll Facebook the message that I, I want to give you. So, if, so the whole world is changed, but sometimes there's a gap between where education is and the current environment. So connected learning is about bridging that gap and really looking at that proverb alone and, and creating that type of teaching environment, which we think um, and research is showing is more towards 24th century learning to, to, to really be able to keep up in the, the competitive marketplace of where things are going. You know, I, this slide here really is, is around Generation Y. So I like to think of Generation Y as everyone's a winner baby. And what do I mean by that? Well, I don't know about any of you, but I'm Generation X. When I went to school and I did the egg and spoon race or I did athletics, there were little things that you get for first, second and third. So you get your little bit of um, paper saying, yep, you, you came first. But now when you go to school and you join ath athletics, like when my daughter does, it's completely different. Everyone's a winner. Everyone gets a certificate. Everyone uh, gets a, a feeling that they've participated and all is good. However, when you take that generation and you work in the workplace like I do, it's not quite like that. You know, I don't kind of get the work that I do. I don't kind of get a pat on the back. You know, sometimes my boss could go, you know, up to a year before I might get a, a compliment from him. So really the expectations of students um, and how they uh, are growing up in their, their own families and through the education system often isn't what it's like when you get to get to the workplace. So we get things like um, statements from industry saying things like, well, you know, students aren't ready to be employed by us, which is why, you know, recently there's been a lot more in Australia around digital badging, for example, as a way to, to make students feel more, um, that they're more ready for, for industry by creating, say, for example, I'm doing an engineering degree, but I need to um, have more communication skills to interpret what business wants into an engineering outcome, I might do a, a communication badge. So definitely we're seeing changes in the sector as to how they address these. What's also interesting is, um, you know, we've got students' debts are soaring and the, the number one thing that a student wants, they'll take the debt, but that's not what they want. What they really want is a job. So for them to, and because they're coming from Generation Y, many of them that are coming in, um, they want to get a job that's a great job. You know, they don't necessarily want to get out of this um, out, out of their degree and then be working in a kind of a job that's just on the minimum wage that that isn't their expectations but often they're finding that they're, t they're taking time to get those jobs or they are actually not getting the, the job that they desire to get so there's some of the problems that we're we're seeing and certainly when I'm out talking to universities that's also something that they're trying to address how do we get students more ready for industry and closer. Does anyone have um, any thoughts on how that relates to, to Swinburne University and maybe some of the ways that you're looking at, at these issues and, and helping to address them? Just like to get some thoughts on that before we move on. Uh, no? Oh, yeah. Well, absolutely. We understand the importance of employability and there's a lot of talk you know, within our faculty about job outcomes and the importance of that. Mm -hmm. So it's certainly something that we're aware of and we know that that's what students are, are looking for when they finish their degree. 
recently we had a presentation from Glenn Bates, who's the BBC of Student Advancement. Advancement. Advancement, that's right. And, um, and it was about the graduate attributes and the, um, you know, what employers were looking for. And I think they mentioned a few things, things like, um, you know, to be a problem solver. Mm. Um, you know, creativity, and also the ability to, to be able to take feed, take on criticism or mm. feedback. Um, so that was the key things that, that came out of that report. That, that's really interesting because we have a graduate program at um, Cisco, as, as most uh, multinational um, organisations do. And you know, what I speaking, I, I work with some of the graduates in, in training them up, um, and speaking to some of them, we've had many in sort of floods of tears that normally I'd think, gosh, they got that information and they're crying over that because they're not used to it. Whereas, you know, if my boss says something like that to me, it kind of goes over my head and go, whatever, you know, I'm kind of of that, I guess, a, a different um, generation. So even the way we have to deal with that problem, we've had to be more sensitive to those graduates to where, you know, we've got baby boomers in our um, organisation who are, who are more like, you know, who are completely different, that's, com you know, for them to sort of, you know, it's more like, you're lucky to have a job and I'll give you what feedback I want. That's a, a different um, era versus what, you know, this generation are used to. So we, we're seeing, um, we as an organisation even have to work of, of how we respond because we want to attract the newer generation in and we want to ensure that we're innovating and so forth by attracting these people. So it's, we have to look at the same, the same type of issues. Would you say there's a say Gen Y is the most connected generation ever through social media, etc. But it sounds like you're saying that in the industry there's an issue with their pers interpersonal skills, mm. perhaps. And you know, you're talking about communication and, and you know, taking criticism and providing feedback. So is that is absolutely that like speaking to a number of universities and you know recently having to having a discussion with Deakin at that. That's something that they're they're seeing is they're having um, they've had industry come to them and said, hey, we don't. And, and engineering was an example of that. We you bring out all of these students with engineering degrees and yes, they look great on paper, but I can't put them in front of a customer because they can't interpret a business outcome because they don't have the business skills and you need to understand the way business works to, to give an engineering outcome. So there's definitely gaps and that's why they recently ran, um, well, were very heavily involved in the digital badging forum where a number of, there was five universities was held at. Um, we're, we're looking at how do we assess digital badging, what's the future, but it was to address these type of, type of um, problems that, were, that industry were basically feedback they were giving towards universities. It is a paradox, isn't it? The, the, you know, the whole movement towards efficiency and, and uh, uh, you know, technical you know, online this, delivery, yeah. and, and, and then the potential disconnect that creates in terms of uh, the way we communicate and the way, the way we interact. Face-to-face you know, -face communication is always more complex and more rich than, than, than you know, online communication. A lot of that work mm. will be online though, and more so in the workplace. You see a lot more of your work based at your desk in, in, in certain industries. industries and in all yeah. the yeah, absolutely. That's a big trend. We call it activity-based working. I worked on a project um, that is, is rolling out the moment at, at Telstra, and um, they call it neighbourhood working, but it's, it's, it's activity-based working. But they recently um, refitted um, George Street, which is their um, head office in Sydney, and it was all around um, creating spaces to 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 work in, but they're also giving all the tools for these people to work from home, so they didn't actually have to be in those spaces. But when they were in the spaces, they wanted them still to encourage them to those spaces. So how did they create um, spaces that would work? And you know, the design factory did something that Telstra also did was that kitchen space, and people kind of flood to the kitchen and interact there because they made it a really um, a space that was you felt comfortable in. Because that's why if you think about when you have friends over often they're hanging around the kitchen, they might be sitting on benches, but you know, you're chatting to your friends, you make, you're making them some food, you're sharing ideas and so forth, and that feels natural to us. So, you know, they, that was a real, they actually spent a lot of money on technology, but they spent a hell of a lot of money on the kitchen too, because they realised that that was a critical place where ideas came from. So, you know, these kind of things are really important when you're looking at um, new buildings, um, and I'll, I won't touch on that because I'm going to talk about a few universities doing that, but they're, they're very critical to look at those, those type of things. So it really is a, is, a, is a changing landscape with, you know, a billion tweets a week happening, all of this information, you know, I, I get comments like recently I spoke to um, QUT and they said, well, every student has an email account uh, and 
40% of students, if we send them an email, they don't read it because they're not into email. That's yesterday. It's a bit like the mail now. Like the only mail that I really get is formal mail. Um, some bills, a lot of it's online now, but I'll get something from some politician telling me to vote them when it's the election or it's type of formal thing. So I don't get my informal day-to-day -day communication through the mail. And really, email is the next generation of, of the mail. It's, it's a way, um, we'll see some of the tools that we've been using to communicate instead of um, email throughout this presentation, but it's also the next sort of industry that is changing in itself is, is the way we communicate through email. And you know, Generation Y are fantastic at not using email because if you look at, um, if anyone here has any high school students in particular, I'll use that as an example, but you know, I've had people say, well, my year 10 student, we, he gets his maths homework, he comes home, they set up like a chat room in Facebook and they all work out the answer and then they present it back as an individual. Because naturally they know that to collaborate together it's easier to get an answer, but then individually they, you know, in the education world, we call that cheating. In, in the uh, workplace, we call that collaborating because it's like, I've got all these jobs to do. How do I get information and collaborate and do things quicker? So sometimes the way we're educating isn't matching up to, to the real world, to industry, or how to people are naturally learning or how the, the change of learning is happening. So that in itself is, is, a, is, a, is something you have to to look at and address to the point where, you know, I was at, at theatre in Queensland the other week and um, I don't know if any of you attend, I know a couple of you probably attended at least. Um, it was interesting to sit in some of the um, sessions around um, social media and also the problems that happen when you, you do go down the social media route to, to communicate with students because you could say, well, you know, we, we can do this option, we can, we can start using social media, but they're all always, it's a double-edged sword on how you do things and I think, um, has to be thought out considerably, you know, before we, you go and address that. I mean, that could, that's a topic in alone, which would be interesting for you to, to, to have as a session in itself, is, is how do we address these, these issues. And, and staying relevant to, to the student. You know, I, I have been spending a lot of time with the students um, here today, and, and part of what we were doing, we were trying to educate ourselves. So we watched a lot of TED Talks on the education system, which getting ideas from around the world. We also, um, you know, we we looked at videos because a lot of the information that we needed to learn around the education system was sort of freely available online. And we we went to industry itself. We spoke to Professor Lance Ford, and we got ideas. So a lot of the things we could do um, outside the formal structure of of the university, i.e., we didn't have to go to a library and, and do this research. We were doing it on our on our own back, and that's really how how students are, are learning now. And especially um, if you look at some of the research on how people learn, it's, you know, it's creating content. When you start to look at online learning, it's creating content that's, you know, short and sharp and interactive over video and so forth, um, rather than uh, long-winded, you know, posting up something for 30 minutes isn't going to necessarily engage students the way that they learn now. And if you look at some of the work that's coming out of um, Stanford, they're, they're doing um, you know, a couple of minute videos, then students need to interact and so forth rather than just, you know, posting a whole heap of content and then looking at it afterwards. Because you want to get them to interact quickly so that they keep staying online and interacting rather than just chucking a whole heap of content on it. Because, you know, I, I've even had um, uh, universities, QUT said to me that they had found that students were passing that their degrees without um, and passing their exams without downloading or using any of the content that was given to them by the university. So where there's definitely been some, you know, research when they looked into it that students are actually able to sort of pass things with not necessarily using the content that they're given to help them pass. And that proposes a, um, a new challenge to universities is how do we stay relevant and who is our competition in the future. So I'm going to now show you um, a five minute video for, for a few reasons. First of all, I want to show you how um, industry is looking at ways to, to get students to, to sign up to their type of courses. So this is a course created by industry itself. Um, the guy who created this course is a, is a multi-millionaire entrepreneur um, and the way he um, delivers his course content is through other entrepreneurs who are very successful. For example, if you want to learn about um, marketing tools through social media, he does interviews with you know, someone who has 
you know, a million plus likes on Facebook and knows how to grow Facebook, for example, very quickly. So he's taking industry itself to teach his course and it's what um, we call subscription-based learning. So at the moment, if I sign up for a degree, I sign up for four years and I get that degree. Subscription-based learning is more about $99 a month, I learn this. And I, you know, given my internet card over the internet, I can be from anywhere and I'm learning this type of course. And it's not even, um, and none of the, the course content is by people who have education backgrounds or degrees. They're people who've been successful in business, sort of teaching that particular part of the module. So I'm gonna show you a short video on that. So I've, I couldn't, embedded in the presentation because of the way he's put it in his website. So I'll show it to you now. But I think the way he markets this through storytelling is really something um, Swinburne should consider as well because he's quite clever on how he markets this as well. Basically, I'll explain the program. So if you actually um, look into the program, it's it's about, um, he does a lot of um, short videos with, um, and he does a lot of, um, a lot of podcasts, which is really big in the US, with um, any interviews. The only people who educate on this is industry. So there's no no one with an education background. So it's people who start up their business. It might be if they've been fantastic at getting um, social media to work, then he'll he'll interview them. They'll provide the the course content. If they've been um, you know brilliant at doing um, marketing, then he'll he'll give advice on, you know, even to what programs that you, you might use if you're starting up a business, like here's some of the ones that are free. It's, there's a lot of um, content in there, but what I'm saying is, you know, the future of um, education isn't as clear as what it was, you know, 10 years ago. The way that the market's changing and the way that even um, we're seeing in the US, more and more industry are, are also offering their own type of courses, you know, and even around, um, there's opportunities for universities to work with um, work with industry. So, for example, um, I know recently Telstra got involved with um, Deakin to do a, a digital badge around Telstra. So, for that example, um, Telstra has an amazing graduate program that many people want to to get involved in. Um, if I had a digital badge around that before I apply for their program, I'm more likely to say be employed over, say, someone who hasn't taken the process to do that. So, you know, I think that there's, I think to, to look alone at just university as your competition is, it may be today, but I don't believe that's the future tomorrow. Does anyone have any thoughts about what they've seen on that video? Or if I'm talking absolute rubbish and I'm being too provocative and controversial, or what, what do you think um, working in this industry? I think the idea of the startup camp that was a marketing video. Mm. You're not going to get 40,000 new businesses a month or millionaires a month. But the idea of content online that's free that's not associated to a uh, university is probably the inevitability. The idea of university probably will be knowledge creation will be developing skills that it'll be a practical environment. You'll, you'll learn how to apply rather than, you know, you can YouTube anything and you will have more knowledge than any single person can ever teach you. You can't apply it anywhere unless you have the facilities and the mentors and the environment to do it. So, so yeah. yeah. I imagine it will change to a different model, but whether it's competition for content delivery, I don't know. Yeah, and I think what he does really well on this, um, he probably makes a lot of young people want to sign up for his $99 a month because not everyone can afford to sign up for, for 20,000 and there's an absolute market for that. And also because he storytells and he constantly teaches by storytelling, as in he gets other people to tell their stories. Um, you know, if you look back at how we learn and there's, you know, psychology on this as well, that storytelling is a very powerful concept to, to teaching. So he's kind of got hold of that concept and, and uses that to his advantage. And he's filling a gap in the market, which is, you know, maybe someone who wants to start off small, but dream big. And, and, and get them to sign up. But I think even the way he markets is different to how I've ever seen any university video as well, because he kind of plays on your emotion. You kind of think, oh, do I want to sign up to this guy when you're, when you're young and you're looking at that? So it's... But is that a good thing in playing on people's emotions? I mean, he's very charismatic and it makes me want to sign up, but there's no oversight, there's no quality assurance of what he's... I don't think he cares, because he probably just wants to be <laughs> to yeah, make money, but that's, that's yeah, exactly right. Many, it might be great, the program might be excellent, they might be very valuable, but it doesn't necessarily have the same quality standards that we have in higher education here or in... Ab like absolutely, and I'm not saying he will replace it, but he's the future of what could come that we need to consider. And I think it's largely already, already here. Like, 
completely yeah. agree with that, but I think the, we need to, higher education needs to be clearer in, in mm. putting across its point of difference. It's, it's competitive advantage over yeah. what he's offering. For example, if I want to get into my own business, why is doing a degree better for me over something like that? It's, it's being able to articulate that, and, but market it in a, in a way that will make me want to Absolutely. sign up. Attempting to approach a different demographic altogether. He's still wanting to get those students who don't want to get into debt, who want to start up a business. Um, so he, he is. But he's also wanting to get those people who have tried to yes, set up a both. business and have failed. Exactly, I agree. He did or who have degrees. never gone to university. He did highlight people who are unemployed or not working minimum wage after the degree, which yeah. suggests that his target audience is after a degree. Or people who feel they couldn't quite do a degree, I think, as in, because it's not so formally, like you said, there's not the formal qualifications in the exams. Um, it may be people who feel intimidated by doing that degree or don't want to spend that amount of time. You know, I think there's, a, there's different markets that he's, he's trying to get. But I just wanted to show you that of a kind of, of possible futures and to give you an idea of, of how things are changing and how things need to sort of be looked at and marketed at because we can't, you know, as you know, anyone who works in, in business or even in yourself, every, every day is a different day and we always have to look at ways on how we improve the student e experience and what will that student experience be. I'm certainly not immune to the marketing thing that is going on there. I mean, Swinburne's ad um, with the, the, what was it, success and, mm. you know, moving forward and technology. That was a good, that was a good that's, campaign. That's a, yeah. It's a real rev up kind of ad and you leave it going, wow, what a great organisation. Yeah. You know, but does it, does it have any quality assurance? Does it have oversight? Does it have, you know, like we, we're not actually promising anything, but it does appeal to emotion. But you, you're emotionally buying, which yeah. is sort of um, the, the why, why, why Swinburne, which is, is what the, that does. Yeah. But, but when you start going to the you know, with, with, with uh, um, no, we're, we're talking about about where we think our market is, and, and the market may have a completely different perception about about well, um, you know, what we have what we have to offer. And does that mean that, that if we continue? Think. Yeah, but that, that yeah. makes the point. The market's not a person. <laughs> no, but what what's what is interesting is the PwC report that came out um, recently, which is stating that in the next 10 years, um, roughly 40% of Australian jobs won't be here. So the job that I'm doing now, for example, I won't be doing in um, the next 10 years. So that also, um, with that sort of, you know, when you hear that statement, you think, oh God, am I in danger? But what that also creates is um, opportunity because when there's risk, there's opportunity. And the, the opportunity to, um, for continuous learning rather than just getting my degree, going off on my merry old way and then becoming a, you know, working for an airline and just doing that for the next 30 years, that's no longer viable. So it's that continuous learning. So that gives, you know, I've um, recently been asked by um, Deakin Digital to do, um, to do a master's, which they'll, they'll want feedback from industry to, to say how, what, what we think of that, because they, they've decided that they're going to target industry more. And um, for that master's, you don't actually, you won't actually have to have any previous qualifications, but you have to have a certain amount of industry experience in, in technology. So it's things like that by addressing um, other target markets rather than just the, the current market. So there's definitely, I, I do think that the future is changing, but it's also changing for those employed in the jobs that have come out of uni and have the jobs that they're, they're not necessarily safe either. So I think there's a two-edged sword that universities can um, gain market share from. So where there's risk, there's opportunity. Um, you know, buildings, does it attract students? I recently went to um, Adelaide University. I don't know if anyone's been to, to the hub in Adelaide. Really am amazing um, experience because it's, it's really a place where students just hang out all the time. If you go there, the, it feels like the rest of the university is this wasteland because no one, other than walking to places, no one's there, but they're all in the hub. You know, they've created an environment where um, from a architectural point of view, you feel like you want to want to stay there. I even had, um, when I was at theatre, some of the, the guys um, from QUT were telling me that they, the university um, had the experience where they had students wanting to sleep there. So they almost, the hub became so good that 
students were s staying there. I'm not sure if that was a, a good or a bad thing. But actually, when I spoke to Flinders about that, they said, well, that's a good thing because we actually want to um, both um, uh, Flinders and um, UWS are currently looking at ways to um, attract students in stay in the space more and they're doing architectural and um, educational development around that to, to make the student experience uh, more fun on campus and not just about coming to learn but to create um, you know great activity around that as well and one of the other things that um, UWS has been looking at is around um, industry so in um, Western Sydney is to create hub spaces where industry can come and work from and maybe renting out that space but in return also at a sort of cheaper rate you know that, that industry might mentor students and so forth so they start to get um, industry and um, you know and the sector closer together and if you go to places like Singapore they do a really good job of this they're, when it comes to um, industry and education they're, they're much closer than we are in Australia so I think it's always good to look at some examples overseas and what what they're doing and how they're doing to to create that because the number one reason why these students are sitting here today is, is to hear me no it's not is because that they they want to get a job at the end of it so if we can create an environment where that becomes more more possible then you know it, it's a much better experience so it's, it's it's around creating space with that in mind rather than creating space for the fact that we we need space yeah, no, absolutely. This is interactive. I think that that's certainly uh, an important aspect to get industry involved in, and, and that's the way we're heading. But uh, it's just interesting, even today on, in the radio on the way in, you know, I was listening to the, the fact that I think it's Blackmores is, uh, is sponsoring a, a review of, the, of um, you know, uh, natural medicines. And I think we've got to be careful a little bit if we go down the line of, of, of following the mm. agenda of, of big business. And there's some pretty, you know, horrible examples in, in other countries. Agree. The, the, the agenda of the university is dictated to by, by big business. And then big business paying the university yeah. big money that they feel that they have to go down a certain path to keep the funding coming in. And we all know funding's often a, a continuous problem globally around um, education. So you're right, there's always these things you have to consider without just delving into it. But there are a number of uni universities right now in Australia trying to to look actively at these models on how do we get to improve the student experience on campus through through design and through um, industry itself. So, you know, we talked a little bit about this before, but it was, you know, the then was in the past. So it was like big teams, big lectures, everything was on campus. In fact, when I um, went to university, a lot of the students that um, when they were picking where to go they would pick where it was located or how close it was to home and so forth so it was more like I'm going to go to this university because it's closest to me or if they were doing certain things like um, medicine or law it might be you know I want to go to Melbourne because I think it'll look better on my CV or there were there are other reasons but now it's it's not about um, it's not about that because like that that gap of having to worry about traveling to on campus is is disappearing so with more and more things becoming online or the ability to be on and off campus to to learn there's um there's challenges there is that as well how do we how do we address that and and scheduled learning as well so when i went to university you know some students had jobs but they were usually not as much as students have to work now to to, to stay um in a course they're doing sort of quite long hours often working as well so you know fitting in you, when I went to RMIT, it was almost like five days a week I had something on, so I could, it would be hard for me to have got a job other than than weekend or night work, for example. Whereas now, um, if you look at some of the way things are scheduled, there's there's gaps in the week where students can can do that. So it's definitely changed, and the tools were few and far between because you would communicate face to face with your students, or they would submit things. I mean, when I um, last submitted um, an essay, I went to an office and handed it in. But we were using computers then, but we have to print it out and give it in. We didn't even um, didn't even email them. So, you know, it's um, it's a changing landscape. And and now this the student environment's matching the the work environment. When I talked about Telstra before, it's about being um, able to in the industry being able to work remote. In some jobs obviously, you know, if you're um, working um, as an ambulance in, in an ambulance and you're um, a 
you, you're going out to see people, you obviously can't do that remotely. So there's there's some things, although to be honest, there's a lot with video technology now and diagnosis that things are changing there as well. So it was, industry was more, um, you know, you had to be somewhere, whereas now students want to learn remote. They want agile type learning, so more flexible learning. It's not about, um, you know, having a learning environment that's too rigid. They need to have some flexibility because that's also what we expect of that, um, even in the workplace. And, and less time because, my goodness, if we had to read the one billion tweets a week, we certainly would have less time. But we're definitely getting a lot more information thrown at us now through our devices and so forth. We do seem to have less time and many tools. You know, I recently um, did a, a presentation with a, a university in New South Wales and I loved this comment and I'll ask you what you think about it. They said, Ellie, do we have to buy any of your stuff that Cisco have? I mean, obviously we need the network because nothing really runs without a network. But everything we, we use, the students then go find their own tools and don't use anything that we're using. So, so is it to the point where we just go, just use whatever you want and we'll still have a few tools that we have to do Obviously, we still need network, we still need email and a few fundamentals. But what do you think about that statement? Do you, is it worth universities looking at spending money on technology to improve things or do they just let students use whatever? What's your thoughts on that? Because that came from a CIO. Anyone got any thoughts on? Well, I think it's growing. Is it? Yeah, I think you're right. Things are things are changing. So I think um, it is something that um, IT departments in universities have to to consider. And and the real way that they do that is, which has not of, often been the past in working in technology for some time now. Most organisations, and certainly not just universities, they look at, hey, how cool is this technology? We need this, rather than going, what's the use case? What's the business case? Why? What? How are the users going to use it? Is it relevant? And looking at that first before you even consider the technology is so much more vital because if, if teachers are confident with what you introduce and they have some say in it, then they're more likely to use that because confidence means you're more likely to use that tool than if you think it's, you know, they've introduced this, it's, it's you know, I know from working with many users, even myself, if there's a shorter way of doing things because I don't like the tool they've introduced, even in my own workplace, I'll find that way, because that's how we naturally develop. So, were you going to say I was comment? Say, on that point of if students are bringing their technology with them, do we need to supply that? I mean, it gets to a dangerous path. If they can't afford it, you become very elitist and you're disadvantaging a lot of students potentially mm. because you're not supplying them. They've paid a lot of money to come to university and then you turn around and say, We're not going to supply you with anything, bring your own stuff. That's a really so good point. A lot of people. So, it's almost a, an obligation of the university mm. to give everyone an even platform to work from. So if you need them to have a computer, you should be able to supply them the computer. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, they did. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's an interesting comment because I recently had a discussion with them about that. And there's a, um, and the CIO said, when they, they brought that out, that they felt that was the right thing to do, to introduce to give everyone a tablet, but they said now, if you ask me that same question, we wouldn't do it because I do. it's if you require yeah, the because they they yeah the we will give you one. Yeah, but it was more because they felt well, well students have these things, and I, and I have this from industry as well, saying well, why should we supply a laptop and a a mobile because everyone coming to the workforce seems to have this stuff anyway, and it's. You still have to have a, an option for it because you can't make an assumption that every single person who's going to walk in your door is going to have um, access to that. And then you do um, limit who you're allowing through your door. And, you know, socioeconomically, that's not the best thing to do because you're limiting people who might not have access to that. And I often, you know, even when I talk to TAFEs, that's a, a big question of more so they find that, you know, a lot of, they have a higher age group in learning. So there's a lot of people 30 plus that are going through TAFE and they said, you know, we, we can't make any assumptions that they're, a lot of them haven't even, um, being tradespeople and so forth, haven't really even used, um, you know, laptops or don't use them. They, they might use a smartphone, but they, 
they've got even they've got even different considerations to consider. It is, yeah, there's definitely a balancing act. That's why all that I'm saying today really is just um, creating your creative thought processes on these issues. There's no real one answer fits all and I can go, here's Utopia, here, I can create the, you, you know, the most amazing university, all you need to do is sign up to $50 million of my technology. You know, that's certainly not, not the way, but I think we have to sort of take findings from what, what's happening, um, happening in industry and happening in the, the sector and combining some of that when, when learning about new challenges and how we address them. And, you know, from, from what we're seeing and what the, the technology that Cisco provides is really from, from pocket to campus. So, you know, um, we recently, I worked on a project with um, John Monash Science School, which was a really fun project because um, what, their, what their business need was they wanted to address um, sciences in year 10, which is when most students um, traditionally drop out of sciences and they wanted to improve that number. And um, some of the best science teachers aren't always out in tiny regional schools, so they wanted to um, offer their science programs to regional areas that wouldn't necessarily have someone who could teach, say, quantum physics. Um, and how they addressed that was um, through using um, web-based and video technology and green screen technology. For example, um, had a, a number of departments um, who, were, who were recently out here from Northern Territory and Queensland go to one of their um, quantum physics classes and they found that really interesting because when they were talking about the, the black hole, for example, they were in the black hole and then they were videoing that out to the students. And um, just, you know, on that, we recently had um, an experience with um, Lance Ford, which is, um, he, he works um, alongside us at Cisco, but he teaches teachers how to use technology in a, in a way that will engage students. And, um, you know, I'll just open it up to the experience you had with um, Lance Ford. What did you think about that in terms of the tech? Te I'll just explain the technology. So he was in the US, we had a video meeting with him, and then he showed us some of the technology and, and how He's, that can be used for teaching. So I'll. Yeah, so uh, our session with Lance for it was, it was very fun, it was very engaging. It, it wasn't just sitting there and just listening to him talk all the time. It was, it was an open engagement back and forth. It was, it was enthusiasm to the full extent. Um, he was, I mean, the fact that it wasn't just sitting down in a chair for him, he it was moving around. It was going from touch point to touch point. It was showing this, walking over here, doing that. Um, really sparking our minds to new ideas. Mm. It's really interesting. He used um, a lot of collaborative technology as well. So, you know, he was on the big screen and we could see him. We could also see us in the bottom. But there was also a shared screen where he could show us things from his computer and then we could connect to that screen from our phones or from our laptops. Mm. And through an app. Say, yeah, through an app. And we could actually go, oh, well, what's this part? You touch it on our phone and it would come up on the screen mm. as well. But then his students um, mm. also came up with an idea to do a green screen kind of thing mm. and then he did it from his like cupboard where he would go in there and there was another screen in there and because there was a green screen behind him all of a sudden he was standing on the Great Wall of China and he was talking to us from there or he was behind a newsroom and it was it was just different mm. it was engaging and it was really interesting yeah and and he made you want to you know, I think he, it got to the point where we were feeling, oh, we didn't want the session to end because it was, and that, that's really, that's our dream. That's our utopia when a student's feeling like, I don't want this session to end. This is, I'm learning something. I'm engaged. I feel part of this. And by the way, he's in the US, we're in Australia. And that's how we felt with the technology that we were, we were using. And it might be um, another session that we could run at some point to sort of show this in action and how it works, because I think it'd be quite we interesting for lunch. teachers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we had that you had that, you did. Yes. Yeah. The Great Wall of China, right? yeah. he was like, that's me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a good good way of, if you're looking at online learning, it's a, a good way of, um, you know, experiencing, experiencing that. And, you know, we're certainly seeing, um, the other emerging thing we're seeing is being able to um, 
create these sort of video libraries. So in the past it was library libraries. We want to create more video libraries with short, sharp and interesting content where people can, can go and share ideas. But not just a library that's created content by um, the teacher, but where the student and the teacher are creating the teaching by also being part of that that content. So, you know, Cisco's got top, got has technology around that that um, we we use as well. In fact, we did, we recently just did some recordings where we were um, the other week when um, the students were at Cisco and we were just um, throwing out ideas and recording them, and then we can you know visit them on the library and um, it was quite interactive that way, and you can give feedback, rate them and so forth afterwards. So it was a real collaborative way to learn. And uh, one of the other things that we've been um, using, I just wanted to talk about this, this tool because um, this is a business tool, but it's also can be used with, with students. And what I mean by a business tool is, you know, if I'm um, wanting to communicate with Telstra, I certainly can't get onto a Facebook chat group and set it up and say, hey, Telstra, we've got a meeting today, let's meet up and you know, connect to them on Facebook and do that. That would be an absolute no-no. But we're bridging some of that gap by using similar social media tools that are built for business to, to do those things. And I've been using those with the um, students. So I'll just show you a quick um, look and feel of the, um, the tool and then I'll um, ask the students to open up on, on their experience with that. So um, just to explain this here, you can see on this side I've got a number of um, rooms set up. This one I'm in now is um, Swinburne Design Factory room, but I have meetings with um, my various colleagues. Uh, so instead of like in the past we would have emailed, for example, um, you know, there's a this Southwest one, there's a tender out from Southwest um, at the moment and rather than set up, send up all these emails between ourselves about this tender, we've created a room where we'll share all the documents on it and we'll discuss things. So in the past I would have gone, hi Sally, please see attached tender. Cheers, Ellie. It's much more formal. At Sally tender and you see the document there. It's, it's a lot sharper, faster, which is um, often how like when you're using, um, when we're using the room, that's, that's how we, we use it as well. It's not like in the formal way. So here we've been sharing, um, we've been sharing ideas, we've been sharing, um, you know, we're still not saying, you know, we're just using these tools and we're not getting together. There's still whiteboarding sessions and, and so forth, but we share those ideas, take the pictures included in here. We can, for example, I can see that these are external people, they're not internal to my company, so I can be a bit more careful going, oh, but be careful what I send the students, but not really, the students are easy going, I better be more careful with my colleagues. But, um, you know, we can also do, um, I can start a, a video call um, and it will dial out, oh, actually I'll, I won't do that. It'll dial, they won't, don't need to pick up, but it will dial out, I'm the only person in the meeting, I won't get them. They can actually answer that and join a meeting and we can then have a video discussion about what we're talking about. But it's certainly been um, a far more interactive tool than if we were working on this project for the last three months over email, I think it would have been a completely different experience when we're not together than using this tool. So I'll just open up to the students. I know we've only got about five minutes, but we'll kind of end on, on this, but I'll open up to the the students around what they thought of this tool versus other tools they've used and their experience with it. Yes. <clears throat> so I think um, one of the biggest points was that it actually gave the uh, communication happening when we were working, so it wasn't we do a chunk of work and then sort of email it off and here's what we've done and get a response next week and, and do that. It would just sort of be like, oh, I'll post up, like take a photo of what we're doing on the board, mm -hmm. send it to Ali, and then everyone else would be working, be like, hey guys, they've said this or something, or they've posted up this, and we'd change it like on the spot. So it's sort of the, I guess that's mm. the sort of advantage of instant messaging, Quick. but yeah, that's that's why where email falls flat is that it's, it takes a while to get And there's it. a culture around email. It's sort of like in our company, the culture is, yeah you got 24 hours to respond, general, depending on who the person is. If it's your boss, maybe shorter time. Not that he says that, but you know, you know, I've noticed that people, when the certain emails come out from certain titles, they'll respond a lot quicker than they ever get to respond to you. My title's never important enough to get a quick response, but there's a culture around, around that, but Spark's a lot less formal. You really don't sort of see that titles on the emails and so forth. There's just this room where things are constantly flowing and we set up different rooms depending on projects that we're working on, so it's a, it's an even flow, that experience. Did anyone else want to comment on? I've worked on two virtual collaboration projects in the past, one with the principal in Uganda and one with the scientists in America, and because of the time difference, I've sent an email today, and I might not get a response for another three or four days, depending on what they're doing, but I would need the answer now, because I'm doing this big project with them, I'm trying to help them, and I'm like, I need your input, whereas with this, you can put it on straight away, and I'll get a message. Mm -hmm. 
if not within a few hours, and it's so much faster, and you can share links mm. really fast, like you saw the photos mm. and the emails again with an email, it takes ages to upload a, a link, and it you only upload a certain amount. Um, it was just so much more um, streamlined, it was yeah. just easier. And it's free to download, so we weren't saying to the students, by the way, sign up for my $99 a month tool, um, which wouldn't be viable. It's um, where we where we make the money is when we um, use this with industry and we combine it in with existing tools that they they have, which, you know, you don't need to do that with, with, with students, but that was a, a great way. And, a, and um, it's a secure way versus using um, yeah. other social media tools that are free out there, but are social tools. And for example, I've got, you know, I am on Facebook, but I might not, the students might not want me to I post um, a lot of pictures about dogs because I'm involved in a dog charity. I'm sure they don't want to see all my dog yeah. pictures. They'll think, God, she really is boring. Um, so do you know what I mean? So it creates a different, I feel like I've got my personal environment and we had our yeah. student business environment and there was sort of a, a separation. But I do know that they also do use things like Facebook sometimes to communicate between yourselves for, for other things. Well, I Yeah. Then you get distracted with all this other stuff, whereas this is purely... Yeah, you don't get distracted. Business. You don't get distracted, you can be focused. Yeah. Um, but also in a bit more of a casual environment. Mm -hmm. so yeah, casual, not the, the formal way of... I think we had that situation with a project yeah, where uh, we wanted to separate the personal from the work. Mm -hmm. We didn't really want others to see, you know, photos of us on holidays. Or yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So how do we do that? Yeah, things like... So yeah, it's a free, I sort of encourage you maybe chat, chatting to the design students at some point, maybe considering um, using a tool like this in some of the things that you want to do if, if you want to interact differently. But it's certainly, we've found it a really fantastic way to communicate. And it's also a tool that we see industry using as well, rather than a, a tool that industry would never use, which would be, as I said, if I want to talk to Telstra, it wouldn't be on Facebook chat room. So really that kind of um, concludes it. I did, you know what? I did did it on the dot. How's that for timing? Well done. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anyone um, got any last minute questions or, or thoughts about what we've seen and discussed today? Did you say Spark is free to download? Yes. Yeah. If you just like um, Google Cisco Spark download, you can do it on any kind of app. It'll then give you the link to, to, to download it. And um, yeah, I encourage you to have a play with it and, and, and so forth and set up some rooms. I mean, I find it good from a work perspective because I've got, diff like I said, that tender we're working on rather than the 50,000 emails and I've got to find which email the document's in. It's easy for me to scroll up and down to find what I want rather than opening 10 emails to find the right one that had X, Y, and Z document in it. Maybe I could circulate some information after the presentation. Yeah, I'd be happy to yeah, type up something to show you yeah. how to download it, how to use it and, and so forth. Um, but I didn't want today to be too much Cisco technology or, or pump down a whole heap of um, you know, products down your throat. I wanted to maybe be slightly provocative and sort of make a few statements on how things are changing and, and sort of get you to start thinking of new ideas and concepts and, um, you know, take things back within your, within Swinburne in the areas that you work in. Any other questions? Do most students find the Spark easy to use? Is it user friendly? Because I've, I've tried a few different versions of these and, and some students like this version and others yeah. like that. And um, I'll admit, at the start, I, I don't use apps, so when I use Spark, I use it straight from my laptop. Um, I just don't like apps on my phone, I don't know why. But um, at the start, just finding my feet, like any new program, it did take me a little bit, but it wasn't like, you know, a week and I figured it out. Like, yeah. I, after an hour, I was like, okay, I know what I'm doing now. Yeah, it's, it's just a similar concept to Facebook Messenger, basically. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not going to be, there's not like a huge technical leap in this type of the box. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, the software developers that we've had um, develop this product are out of the commercial market. Like, we've worked for people like um, Facebook and so forth. So we've, we've tried to make it be more uh, cool looking than business looking. Um, yeah. So it has a bit of that. But it still has to have a business feel to it to a degree. I mean, it can't be ultra cool. I think everyone else in the group uses the, phone, like the actual application on the phone. I just choose not to, but I can still use it. So it's yeah. really good. I particularly find it on the phone very handy just because yeah. the, the push notifications are good. Um, mm. With the uh, four corners um, episode that you recommended. Yeah. The yeah, it was like that night I knew something was coming on about Four Corners and the university sector. And because we've been studying about edu education in the future, I said, oh, well, I didn't know what it was really about, but let's watch this, send that push out at sort of seven o'clock at night and then people could watch it. They were yeah. could see it. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I did the same thing through Blackboard and announced an email that pro probably your method would have been more effective. 
Yeah, because it sends out that push. They go, oh, Ellie's just messaged, oh, there's something on um, I need to watch tonight. If, I, if I'm free, I'm going to watch that. Going back just quickly with the Blackboard thing, you mentioned a lot of students don't check their emails. I guess I'm a little bit more old school again. Like, I will check Blackboard and my student email. It's just what's a habit every morning. I log on to them to see if yeah. I've got any emails. And I'll talk to someone the next day, and they'll be like, oh, so, um, you know, are you, you know, you going to this class to watch this presentation? Or, you know, oh, did you see the thing about the homework? And they're like, what? And I'm like, just send us an email. And they're like, what? And I'm like, it's on Blackboard. And they're like, oh, I don't check my student email. And I'm just like, yeah. I don't know how they do yeah. it. But it's constantly educated. A lot of these students do that. Yeah. Mm. And we can see when they've access, it says last access. And I'll, yeah. I'll look through and just sort of go, oh, well, Johnny hasn't looked onto that <laughs> Blackboard for a month. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Ellie, for You're presenting. Welcome. And thank you to the Design Factory students. Thank you. Yeah. This has been a Swinburne production.